This short presentation looks at this seismic profile, the Ocean Star 0.18 profile acquired by USGS offshore Alaska. We can use it to answer these following questions. We can estimate the water depth to various points across the profile, particularly X and Y, and therefore work out the height difference between these two places down the escarpment that runs down from the point Z on the profile. Then if we look at within the profile itself, at the bottom right hand corner, there's a rather ghostly looking feature down here, which is MM prime. What's that? And then finally, we'll look at this fault feature, which separates those sub-horizontal reflectors beneath Y from the more deformed material that underlies the escarpment, labelled F on the profile. We want to pick that fault and then try and estimate what its real dip might be. So let's start off working out the various bathymetries across here, in other words, the water depth down to the seabed. Well, if we start off at X, we can read off from the vertical scale, which is in two-way travel time, the position of point X. So to work out what that is in terms of bathymetry, we need to know what the seismic velocity of seawater is, which is 1,500 metres per second, or 1.5 kilometres per second. So simply multiplying that value, the seismic velocity, by the travel time, 2.75 seconds, we get the distance that the seismic energy has traveled. And because it's two-way time, to get the real bathymetry, we need to divide by two. So if we plug that all the way through, the bathymetry here comes out as very slightly more than two kilometers. So that's the calculation for point X. Now let's turn our attention to point Y over here. And again, reading off from the left-hand side of the profile, we can see that the two-way travel time there is about 3.6 seconds. So again, if we multiply that by the seismic velocity of seawater and divide by two, we get the real bathymetry there, which is 2.7 kilometers. So we can compare the two places. Two kilometers to the seabed over on the right, 2.7 kilometers over on the left. If we look at the area around the two kilometer bathymetry, point X, we can see that it's underlain by those uh, reflectors, which represent some kind of basin that is slightly higher than the main seabed over on the left. It's, in other words, it's a perched basin. And this basin is separated from the main part of the seabed over on the left by the escarpment, which runs down from Z. And the height of that escarpment is simply the difference between these two values. In other words, it's 700 meters. OK, now let's turn our attention to this ghostly figure down here, M, M prime. Well, this is a multiple. It mimics the shallow geology that runs from the seabed. It's a multiple not only of the seabed itself, but also of that shallow geology. And we can demonstrate that by measuring a simple distance down to the seabed from the sea surface. Bear in mind, the top of this image is cropped. We're not seeing the top one and a half seconds worth of seawater. We have to use the left-hand scale to work out the bathymetry of point Z. So let's do that, picking the seabed and measuring down like this. We can see that the seabed at Z is 2.7 seconds down from the sea surface and the separation from the real seabed at Z down to its equivalent point on the multiple is the identical 2.7 seconds, confirming that this is indeed a multiple of the seabed and the shallow geology that immediately underlies it. Now let's turn our attention to the fault. And we're going to spend a bit more time thinking about this structure. You'll notice that it separates the sub-horizontal strata that underlie Y on the west-south-west end of the section from the deformed material, that rather nice fold structure, and other more complicated features that run up beneath the escarpment that heads towards Z. It's a thrust fault, it's pushing those reflectors that are deformed higher than their equivalent positions on the footwall. And therefore we've marked it by that half arrow showing hanging wall up. But what about its real orientation? Well, as I've interpreted, the fault 
cuts through 0.9 seconds worth of stratigraphy. In other words, the vertical scale there is 0.97. Let's just zoom all this up. Here we go. So there's the horizontal scale, five kilometers at the scale of the zoom up. Let's put a rectangle around our fault so we can work out some gradients. So the 0.9 seconds is that vertical distance across which the fault cuts, and that distance of 0.9 seconds occurs over a horizontal distance of 650 meters. So to work out what the true dip is, we need to understand what 0.9 seconds represents in terms of real distance, in terms of meters. Well, that obviously depends on the size of its velocity. And we don't know the size of velocity of that material, so we're going to run a different set of scenarios. Our first one is to assume all that material is sandstone, and therefore has a size of velocity of 4 kilometers a second. 4 kilometers a second times 0.9, then divided by 2, is 1.8 kilometers, or 1,800 meters. Now we can go on and simply work out what the angle of dip is of the fault plane. It's the cotangent of 650 divided by 180. And that is 70 degrees. OK, so we've assumed that's lithified sandstone. What happens if it's unlithified sands and muds? Well, that would have a lower seismic velocity. In fact, it has a range. We'll try this value first, which has a seismic velocity of 2 kilometers a second. Well, of course, 2 kilometers a second is half of 4 kilometers a second. So simply the vertical scale now becomes 900 meters. Again, we can establish the dip of this fault plane. The cotangent of the dip of the fault plane is simply 650 divided by 900, and that comes out at 54 degrees. OK, let's have one more go. Let's take a lower value, which is about as low as it can get, for the value of seismic velocity for unlithified sediments, and let's assume at 1.5 kilometers a second. If we do that, these are the values we get. Still, the horizontal scale is 650 meters, but this time the fault has climbed a distance of 675 meters. The cotangent of the dip of the fault plane, and that comes out at 46 degrees. So we've got three values for the dip of the fault plane. It's highly unlikely that this material is fully lithified sandstone. It includes material at the modern seabed, so it's much more likely to be unlithified sediments. Well, I'm going to go for the slightly higher value and suggest that this is my preferred option, that the tip of the fault plane is about 54 degrees. So that's how we can work out the true orientation of inclined features on seismic profiles. So this ocean star line has been useful for allowing us to determine bathymetry and its variations across a profile and work out the heights of escarpments on the seabed. We've identified a multiple and we've looked at the orientation of a fault plane and estimated its real dip.